will be in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. It says this, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions, Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for the righteous, or instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Jacob. Good evening. Welcome to Mercy View. My name is Brad. I'm one of the pastors here. And we are honored that you've chosen to worship with us tonight. Thank you for being here. Uh, One of the greatest privileges that that I have had um, over 11 years almost now is the privilege to walk alongside people who have said, hey, I want to grow. I want to grow in my faith. I want to uh, mature in my faith. I I want to uh, get rid of patterns of sin and habits of sin in my life, and and I was wondering, Brad, like, can you help me with that? And, uh, you know, I'm a sinner too, and so um, I'm I'm sojourning with every single person that I've had the privilege to do that with over the years, Um, but one of the questions that rises to the surface almost every time uh, when I'm hanging out with folks, and this is true for my own heart, I, I think this a lot myself is why can't I just get better? And I don't know if that's a question that that you have had in your walk with the Lord, or maybe it's a question you even have right now in your walk with the Lord. You look in at your heart, you you see some sort of a pattern of sin that you would say, man, this is something that I just can't seem to shake. And you're frustrated, you're tired, you've tried to do all that you know to do to try to get rid of that. And you're kind of at a place of of, of loss. You're you're not sure what else there is to do. There have been many moments that I've sat across from a brother at a coffee shop or at a restaurant, and they've expressed that very thing to me. Why do I do, Brad, the things that I don't want to do? Why do I do the things that I know I shouldn't do and... How can I change? I wonder if you've ever asked that question yourself. I wonder if you would even be so honest tonight to say, you know, Brad, that's true of me. That's a question that I have. How do I change? How do I get better? Tonight, we continue our series in the book of Romans, a series that we're calling Reign of Grace because... In these first 11 chapters of the book of Romans, what we really see is the Apostle Paul lifting up high God and his grace and his mercy towards undeserving sinners so that he can take his proper place in our lives as King Jesus. We want King Jesus to reign in our lives. And so as we walk through this book of of Romans, we are asking the Lord humbly to help us understand the ways in which we can make King Jesus, King Jesus, the ways that we can put him on the throne of our hearts. And as we do it tonight, as we move into chapter six, actually, 
I just want to invite you to see one thing this evening, and it's this. God's grace gives you freedom over the power of sin. Would you say that again? God's grace gives you freedom over the power of sin in your life. So if you have your Bibles or electronic devices, keep them open in Romans chapter 6, beginning there in verse 1. And as you look there, I want you to notice what Paul does here at the beginning of Romans 6. He asks a question, and it's really a rhetorical question. Now, if you know anything about rhetorical questions, you know they're not really questions, they're assertions, right? They're, they're statements. They are meant to express something um, that really you already probably know the answer to. Um, Paul's question here in verse 1 is this. Are we to continue to sin that grace may abound? Now, why does Paul want to seek an answer to that question? Well, in the first few chapters of Romans, Paul lays out the bad news about our condition. And then he begins to move into talking about the good news of the gospel that answers our bad condition. And so for the past few sermons, you've got a really big dose of just how good God's grace is. And so as we move into Romans 6, Paul is anticipating an objection from you. He, he's anticipating a, an objection from the original hearers of this, but, but also us. And he is seeking an answer to this question because primarily it was a typical protest on the part of his critics. In other words, his critics or those that had questions about this were thinking this. If God's grace provides forgiveness for my sin, why does it even matter whether or not I sin or not? If on the other side of sin is always going to be forgiveness, what's the point? Why don't I just do what I want to do if grace is going to abound? Paul foresaw that the Christians in Rome might have heard or thought his instruction about grace could lead to that kind of thinking. But one of the things that we're going to continue to see in the book of Romans, and the book of Romans is a long book. We're going to be in it for a while, and so you're going to have opportunities to let these truths uh, wash over you. And tonight is, is, again, one of those, one of the most beautiful aspects of the gospel that we've seen already in the book of Romans is that to be justified means that you have not only been forgiven, but you have been given eternal protection from the wrath of God. What could be one of the results of that reality? Well, it could lead someone to think that they now have a license to sin. So Paul answers his rhetorical question emphatically. Look there in verse 2. He says, by no means, which is another way of saying, of course not, right? And then in the same verse, Paul tells us why. Look there. He says, how can he who died to sin still live in it? Now, um, that's a question another version of the question that I was talking about a while ago that many of us have struggled with. We've asked that question of God. We've asked that question in a gospel community. We've asked that question in a D group. We've asked that question in shepherding and mentoring context. We said, how can I, who I trust in Jesus, still live in sin? And I want you to notice what Paul is doing here. Paul is doing something for us that really begins to get at the very key for why you and I don't find freedom from sin. And for some of you, it's going to sound so simplistic. And on the one hand, Paul is trying to keep things pretty simple for us as he describes the key to freedom over sin. But in doing so, you're going to look at your life and realize it's not that simple. And so what Paul is doing here is declaring what is already true for you if you are a Christian. 
because of your new identity in Christ, this is just what is true about you. You are actually dead to sin. Now, here's where the rub comes in. You say, well, wait a second, Brad. I'm not dead to sin. If you could have looked into my life this past week, Brad, and seen the ways in which I've fallen short of the glory of God, you would know that I can't say that I am dead to sin. So let's, let's unpack what Paul is saying when he says you are dead to sin. Let's say what he's not saying first. Paul is not saying that when you become a Christian, you no longer sin. He's also not saying after you become a Christian over the course of your lifetime that somehow over the course of that time, you will attain some sort of sinless perfection. What Paul means by the phrase, you are dead to sin, means before Christ, you did not have the power to not sin. But if you're a believer, you've placed your faith and trust in the grace of God and you've been justified and you are now righteous, what Paul is saying is you now, on the other side of redemption, on the other side of salvation, have the power in you by the Spirit to resist sin. Now, because you might have the power to resist sin doesn't mean that you won't sin, But what Paul is going to begin to do here in this chapter, you'll see this more next week as well, he is wanting to remind you of who you are in Christ and to be who you are. Now, one of the most challenging aspects, I think, for Christians to understand and to live out is what I call the new creation identity. Paul's phrase here, to be dead to sin, is another way of describing that reality. Paul is saying that you have a power in you now to resist sin. Whereas before Christ, you did not have the power not to sin. Now, on the other side of salvation, you can say no to sin. You can actually resist it. You can move in the opposite direction of sin. That's why Paul uses such a powerful word here, friends. He's saying death to sin. He's trying to communicate that something very pronounced has happened in your life if you are a Christian. Your relationship to sin, Paul is saying, is dead. Now, starting in verse 3, Paul is going to begin to describe more specifically why and how A Christian is dead to sin in their lives. Look there if you would. Paul uses the theme of baptism to begin to describe this reality. In fact, he uses it three times there. Baptized into Jesus, baptized into his death, and buried by baptism into death. Now, Paul is not first and foremost referring to the act of physical baptism here um, as if participation in the ordinance of baptism creates this spiritual reality. One of the things that we try to talk about to our preachers here at Mercy View is that when you come to a passage of Scripture, there is both a near application and a far application to the passage. The near application to this passage is that... that, that, uh, the, the act of physical baptism, or really the theme of baptism, is a symbolic reality for the Christian. Now, a, a far application or a, a secondary application is about the, the act of, of baptism. But uh, Paul is doing something here to help us understand what it means in part to be dead to sin. He's saying that when you receive Christ, the death of Christ becomes your death. From a spiritual perspective, we completely share in the death of Jesus. Now, Paul continues to show us how and why we're dead to sin in verse 4. Look there. Just as we were buried in Christ through baptism, we are also dead to sin by virtue of our participation in his resurrection. Paul contends that if you and I are united with Christ in his death, we are also united with Christ in his resurrection. In other words, to be in Christ is to share in everything that Christ is. But I want you to notice something that's so important for us as we think about how these truths interface with why or how we are dead to sin. There is 
something instantaneous for a, for a Christian when they become one, though not absolute, that describes our reality in Christ there in verse 4. Look at what it says. He says, in order that just as Christ was raised from the death by the glory of the Father, and this is what I want you to notice, we too might what? Walk in newness of life. See, the res resurrection of Jesus not only brings life in the future, if, uh, if you're a Christian and you share in the resurrection of Jesus, part of what that means is we share in the once and final resurrection. But verse 5 is also talking about a newness now. Here's what that means. You, if you're a Christian, you don't have to wait until Jesus returns to walk in this newness. We can embrace this new creation identity and experience Christ's victory in our lives now. So friends, this is what the good news of the gospel begins to bring to us. It's an implication of the gospel. Being united to Christ's death and his resurrection means that there is a very real sense that you can live in the reality that Jesus has broken the power of canceled sin in your life in real time. This is where we get hung up. We've placed our faith and trust in Jesus. We hear these verses about walking in newness of life, but somehow we don't embrace the, the truth and the reality and, and live in this reality that, that we can have power over sin in our life in real time by remembering our unity in Jesus through his death and his resurrection. Now, there is another way that Paul describes how and why we are dead to sin. Look there at verse 6. Paul does something profound here, actually. He links the crucifixion of Jesus to the crucifixion of our old self. What does that mean? Well, it's referring to what Pastor Ryan talked about last week. He is referring to the categorical characteristics of being in Adam. Right? The old self is in Adam, that is where you and I were before Christ, your connection to the curse, your connection to the guilt that came from sin, the penalty of the fall. But Paul is saying that in Christ, the old power of sin over you, listen friends, has been defeated. Now Paul is trying to push us to see something so important. I mean, seriously, this is, again, he's trying to give us the key, really, to help us know how to change. His intent is crystal clear. Look there in verse 7. He says, for one who has died, and what Paul is saying is died in these ways. He's been united with Christ in his death and resurrection and crucifixion. For one who has died like that spiritually has been now set free from sin. Now, on the one hand, what this means is when you place your faith and trust in Jesus, your sins are forgiven once and for all, your past sins, the sins that you've yet to commit. But what I think Paul is trying to push for here, too, is a, a real-time freedom from sin. He's saying that when we see this union with Christ through his crucifixion, his death, and his resurrection, it should bring something to us in our lives. It should bring newness. It should bring a new life. It should bring a free life. Freedom is what Paul is trying to put up and against and over licentiousness or doing whatever you want to do because God's going to forgive you anyway. Paul is trying to say that's no way to live. The way to live, the, the, the way that Paul intends for us to live a, a, a spiritual life that is flourishing and that is thriving is to live a life of freedom over sin. Uh, he's trying to show us that on the other side of redeem, uh, redemption, there is a kind of peace, there is a kind of joy that surpasses what seems to be joy in sin, which ends up just being a fleeting um, kind of joy it, it overpromises, it underdelivers. He's saying, look, friends, there is no comparison between what it means to live in freedom from sin as opposed to living in sin and just trusting that somehow God is going to forgive us on the other side of it all. 
Now, the final statement that Paul makes to help us understand how we can truly live in freedom from sin's power in our life begins there in verse 8. Look there. The text is looking towards the future. We already sort of said this, but that's what Paul means when he says we believe that we will also live with him. That's what he means. And then in verses 9 and 10, he adds something new. In verse 9, Paul declares that death no longer has dominion over the post-resurrected Christ. And then verse 10 comforts us that in sin's defeat, the risen Christ lives for the glory of God. Don't miss this. The, the, this is Jesus conquered sin and death so that his victory could be ultimately for the worship and uplifting of God. Now, one of the things that we all begin to feel, I think, I feel it, when we hear the, this news, this good news about what God's grace has afforded us, the ability, the power to resist sin, to say no to sin, to move in the opposite direction of sin and actually find freedom from it, we look at our lives, we look in at our hearts and we say this, Brad, I, that's not me. Sin still has power over me. I feel stuck. I'm not making progress. And here's the question that many of us wrestle with. How long is this supposed to take? I want you to notice where this ends here in verse 11. Really, Romans 6, 11 is the application of the passage we've looked at tonight. So, he says, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. What does Paul mean by that? How is that the application? Well, a right and biblical understanding of what Paul is saying here will lead, listen, will lead those who are in Christ to have a different orientation in life. In other words, if you are truly a believer, your orientation towards sin should be, you should be changing and moving away from that over the course of, of a lifetime. You should be considering yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. And, and when we wrestle with this, and we're wrestling with it tonight, we need to ask ourselves, why do I not believe this? There's a, a great preacher from the 1950s and 60s, his ministry preceded that a little bit, and, and, but his ministry of preaching was really known during those two decades, a, a great man by the name of Dr. David Martin Lloyd-Jones. And he used this illustration to help his people in London, he was a preacher in London, to understand why we find ourselves dealing so often with this tension as Christians. And he says this, so let's do this together. This is kind of a, uh, a thought experiment. He says, imagine a country where one group of people for centuries has enslaved another group of people. So whenever a member of the enslaved group meets a member of the oppressing group, the member of the oppressing group can order the other person or around them to do anything they want. And if the person doesn't obey, the member of the oppressing group can have him beaten or her killed. They had the right or the power to do that because of their status in the, in the country. But then a good king comes into power. And here's what he says. He says that all the slaves now are free. And he sets up soldiers and police in every town. And he puts judges in place to ensure this freedom. And then as Dr. Lloyd-Jones is telling this story, this illustration, he asks this question, do you think that will be enough? In other words, he's asking, do you think that all of this will be enough for the, the formerly oppressed group to live in freedom? See, the reality is, is that on the other side of this freedom, whenever a member of the enslaved group met a member of the oppressed group, oppressing group, they would still tremble and quake. Now, the members of the oppressing group didn't have the power to do that anymore, but the members of the enslaved group continued to act like slaves even though their status had changed. They, they truly were free, 
but they didn't live according to their freedom. Here's the point. This is the point that Dr. Lloyd-Jones was trying to make. Every Christian in this room is in that condition. It's the only reason that you and I struggle to change. It's the only reason that you and I can't break our bad habits. We don't know who we are. We don't know whose we are. You, Paul is saying this in our passage, you have a real status change if you're a Christian. It's not just in your mind. It's not just symbolic. It really has happened for you, and yet many of us don't know who we are. So friends, that's why this takes so long. This is why this is so frustrating in our lives. This is why it feels like one step forward and and two steps back. For some of you, that reality, and it is your reality if you're a Christian, could be the difference between bondage to sin and freedom from sin. See, the tragedy of being in bondage to something is believing deeply in your heart that you can't change. Hopelessness is birthed in the soil of that kind of mentality. But again, this text tonight says you can be free. You can be free because Jesus defeated the power of sin. The power of sin. You need to see yourself as dead to sin and alive to God. That's what Paul is trying to to remind us of tonight. And this really brings us to the one thing that I want you to see this evening. It is God's grace that gives us freedom over the power of sin. For some of you, again, that reality could be the difference between continuing to be enslaved in sin and freedom. Think with me right now, if you would, just just about like one thing in your life that you'd like to change, in your spiritual life, that is. Think with me about the things we've talked about tonight. And part of what it means to mature in Christ and to grow in Christ is to take the truths of Scripture and lay them over our lives. And when our inner lawyer or inner attorney attorney wants to, to argue with the truth of God, we let the truth of God speak to that, that arguing and we let it trump the arguing. We let it trump the, the pushback that we might want to give. Because here's, here's the thing, and this is what's so true about the book of Romans, God's grace is scandalous. It's surprising. It's undeserved. That's the point. It's supposed to be so overwhelming to our sensibilities as humans that it overwhelms us to the point that we give uh, ourselves to it completely. Here's what's beautiful about this text tonight. It helps us see that for though we still battle sinful thoughts and actions and attitudes, if we're Christians, we are not engaged in the same battle we were engaged in before Christ. Being dead to sin does not mean that our sinful tendencies will be completely eliminated on this side of eternity. But something has changed. And I hope that you can see here in Romans 6 that what Paul is saying is you now have the power to say no. You have power to say no to sin in the power of Jesus' name because Jesus bought and paid for your ability to walk away from temptation and say, I don't have to do what you want. For those of you kiddos that were here just a while ago and listened to Trey's sermon, this is what Trey was saying too. He showed us through the life of Jesus how Jesus could say to the enemy, I don't have to do what you want. I don't have to sin. I don't have to do what is against my God's, uh, my Father's will. Friend, because of what Jesus has done in his death and his resurrection, and because when you place your faith and trust in that good news, you are now united with Christ. And nothing is more beautiful than that. Nothing is more freeing than that. Life change is possible for the Christian. You might be here, here tonight and you need to consider whether or not you are in Adam or in Christ. And that's the only two kind of categories in the world, by the way. If you're here tonight and you would say, I'm I'm 
in Adam, Brad, you might be alive physically, but as you heard Ryan say last week, you're dead spiritually. There is no ability for you to truly change. So if that's something that you want to do, and we don't believe there's any accidents, this, this might, you might have be here tonight because God wants to change your life. Maybe today is the day that you would open your heart to receive him and become in him. But for all of us here, this change is possible. And it's not just any kind of life, but a life that is dead to sin and alive to God. That kind of life, friends, it's the best kind of life of all. Paul wrote this section of Romans, not just so that you could know what it means to be in Christ, which is unbelievable. He wrote it so that you could truly live. And not just in the future, but right now. By the power of Christ and by being united to him, those who trust in him are plunged into his death and they're raised to walk in new lives. May we be who we are. Let's pray together.